Open your Bibles with me to the book of Psalms. Get Psalm 68 and then get 2 Timothy chapter 3. Psalm 68, 2 Timothy chapter 3. This morning we're looking at salvation and the modern versions. Salvation and the modern versions. Our series that we're doing is Christianity 101. And what we're trying to do is, because of the culture that we live in, and there are so many different types of churches that you can go to. You listen to the Christian radio and you'll hear all different types of teaching. Um, what we're trying to do is just go through the Bible and get some foundational teaching so we can know where we are. Last week we looked at, our first message was on sin, the second is on salvation. This is a continuation of last week's message on salvation. This is a message I would normally do on the Sunday night, but with our disciple or training, uh, that I don't have that opportunity, so I'm doing it this morning. And I'm going to make a few comments about the Bible translation issue, but before I get there, I want to talk about the Christianity 101. Be sure to invite people for this. Next Sunday, so we're beginning with the basic outline of how our church is different. You know, many people say that all religions are fundamentally the same. When they only disagree on sin, salvation, heaven, hell, the nature of man, the nature of God, and eternity. Other than that, they're exactly the same. So next week we're going to look at heaven. Wouldn't that be a good thing to invite someone for? So uh, be sure and invite someone for that. And Christianity, Christianity 101, what are we doing? We're just getting foundational doctrine. Verse after verse after verse after verse. Because it doesn't really matter what Jim Alter thinks. It matters what God says. And so that's the foundation of what we're doing. The other thing, so in introducing this message, why are we talking about the Bible version subject? Well, how many of you have noticed that we use the King James Bible here? Have you noticed that? Well, it's not just a preference. We use it for some specific reasons, and a few of those reasons I'm going to demonstrate today. But I want to make this comment. How many of you know people that love the Lord who use other translations of the Bible? Amen. We're all going to be in heaven together. I'm thankful for anyone who wants to study God's Word. I'm thankful for anyone who preaches the gospel, regardless of the translation they use. I'm very thankful when the gospel is preached. Amen? Amen. I'm very thankful for that. So I'm not trying to diminish the Christianity of someone who uses a different translation than we do. Um, I'm going to show you why we use the King James Version of the Bible. And maybe in another message in this series, I'll go more deeply into this subject. As a matter of fact, I know that I will. Um, Lord willing, you know, if he doesn't return and you don't fire me, we'll, we'll have that message coming up. But uh, I, I want to lay the foundation. Normally, uh, I remember when the first time I preached uh, that series, Why Baptist, that led into the book that we were able to write, Why Baptist. And so I went through all of the Baptist distinctives that night. And after the service, a Methodist pastor who was visiting, I was standing out greeting people like I normally do. He put his finger in my face like this. I want you to know, I don't agree with what you said tonight. He's really mad. And I just smiled and I said, well, if you did, then you'd be a Baptist. <laughs> right? I asked him, did you see the sign out front? This is Grace Baptist Church. If I came to your church, I'm sure I would hear what Methodists teach. How many of you think that's fair? You think that that's fair. So when you teach what you believe, you present facts, people who don't agree with those facts are sometimes offended. But facts are stubborn things. Honestly, facts do not care about your feelings. Did you know that? How many of facts don't care about your feelings? I wish I was 6'4". I really don't. I'm happy, you know, being, what am I, 5'7 and about 7 eighths, Almost. This was a cool thing. I always thought I was 5'7". We measured him a while back. We measured me, and I'm almost 5'8". So I grew. Either that or I always measured myself wrong. But I digress. I could wish I were 6'3", or whatever, that people were measured differently. The, the, wishing that doesn't change the facts. Are you with me? And so I'm going to show you some facts today that... Please don't let the facts offend you. Here's what I would say. All of us have to have an authority, and our authority can't be... My authority must be something outside myself. 
right? We need, so I don't need a subjective authority. I don't need an authority that's subject to my thinking. I need to subject my thinking to the objective authority of God's Word. But if you have two books, and there are many more than that, but let's just take it down to two. If you have two books that both claim to be the Word of God, and they are your authority, but they say different things, now you have to choose which one are you going to trust. And so what I would say to you is if you disagree with what I'm preaching today, well, you need to find an authority, whether it's the King James Bible or something else, but you need to have an authority that is outside yourself. Because if you say, I believe the text in the way that I want to interpret it, well, then that's not an objective authority, is it? This is, this is just common sense. And so let's start with Psalm 68. And I want you to see this. So we're looking at salvation in the modern translations. And again, uh, this is not a confrontational message. This is, a, this is an informational message. So if you hold to a different position on the Bible, I just suggest that you study it out. We have studied it. We have studied it. So, uh, I'll, And I'll try not to... I have about 300 books on this subject. And uh, so I'll try not to give you all of that information today. How many of you are thankful that I'm not going to give you all of that information today? All right. Psalm 68. Look at verse 20. Fantastic verse. He that is our God is the God of salvation. And unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. Isn't that a great verse? Let's read it again. He that is our God is the God of salvation. And unto God the Lord belong the issues from death. It's very important that we understand this. That, that salvation is only through God. Would we all agree with that? You can't save yourself. It has to come from God the Lord. And He is in control of the issues of death. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Why am I preaching this message as a part of our Christianity 101 series? Well, look at... So God is the God of salvation, and God has communicated to us about salvation. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. And that from a child, so this is Paul writing to Timothy, and that from a child thou hast known, what? Everyone? What has he known? The Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Let's look at that again. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And we know that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. So what the Bible is telling us is that you can't be saved without the Bible. Is, is that clear? How many of you agree with that? Say amen. amen. You can't be saved without a Bible. So this subject of salvation and Bible translation, how many of you recognize that has to be vital? It has to be vital. Go with me to the book of 1 Peter. First Peter chapter 1. Let's start reading in verse 18. For as much as ye know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things. So redeemed, that is bought, purchased. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. So in other words, we, we can't be saved by tradition. We can't be saved by money. We can't be saved by work. Look at what it says in verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So according to the Bible, you can't get saved without the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Can't get saved without it. Who verily, verse 20, was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So the Bible tells us that before God, before God said in the beginning, He knew that He was going to come and die on the cross for us. And that's just, that's just an amazing, they gave me goosebumps just making the statement, that amazing foreknowledge and grace of God. He loves us so much. Now look at verse 21. 
who by Him do believe in God that raised Him up from the dead and gave Him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So we're saved by the resurrection. We believe in God the Father. We believe in God the Son. We believe in God the Holy Spirit. Verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Uh, you know, one of the things that I love about the Scriptures is in all of these hard doctrinal passages, and this is a very strict doctrinal passage, God reminds us to love each other. That's good, isn't it? And isn't that a good uh, thing to be reminded in a subject like this? Let's love each other. All right? Now, look at verse uh, 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible. Now, would you read these next five words with me? By the Word of God. Everyone, let's do it again. By the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the Word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the Word of which by the gospel is preached unto you. So what is this passage telling us? That it is vital that God's word endures forever or our salvation doesn't endure forever. Because we're born again, not of corruptible seed, that is seed that can die, pass away and corrupt, but of incorruptible, how? By the word of God, which liveth and abideth for how long? Forever. Now, if the Bible's going to abide forever, that means that we can have it today. Isn't that good? How many of you know that you're saved? You know for sure that you're saved. The only reason we can know that we're saved is because the Bible tells us that we're saved. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. I want to be very clear on that. What he's saying there is, not that you can lose your salvation, but there are people that think they're saved, but they aren't. They didn't believe in the gospel that's presented here. They're believing in something else. That believing in vain means you're believing in nothing. So we have to believe the gospel as it has been presented in the Scriptures. Let me get an amen right there. That's a, that's a good place to say amen. All right? So now, let's look at verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins. And then what are those next four words? And that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day. What are those next four words? So what is the gospel? The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, according to the Scriptures. If you didn't have the Bible, you couldn't be saved, because we're saved by faith, and faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. But continue in the things which thou hast learned, the Bible says. And what is that? He said, this, the holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. So this subject of salvation and the Scriptures is vital to who we are. Now, y'all look a little tired today. You look a little tired. You look a little unplugged. And I'm very insecure. And so I need affirmation constantly in this message. So do this. If you do this, I'll know you're with me. Either that or you're falling asleep. So just, just do this. Okay, here we are. We're going to look at salvation in the modern versions. And the first thing that I want us to see in this, this first section is from our Y Baptist book. Pastor Nathan will be going through this with the young people soon. But I, I want you to see this, what the Bible claims for itself and about its words. They are pure words. The Bible says in Psalm 12, 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. So the Bible is made up of pure words. Very important. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 140, Thy word is very pure. 
therefore thy servant loveth it. You can count on them, those words. They are pure words, no errors, only perfection. I'm glad that I can hold in my hands the pure words of God. What a wonderful gift God has given us. And that's how we can be secure in our salvation. Not only are they pure words, they're preserved words. We looked at Psalm 12, 6 a minute ago. Here's Psalm 12, 7. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So how long has God promised to preserve His words? Forever. How many of you believe that? All right, so it's so wonderful. Not only do we believe in the doctrine of inspiration, that's where God gave His words, but we also believe in the doctrine of preservation. Not only did He give them, He preserved them. There's a skeptic, his name is Bart Ehrman, and Bart Ehrman is considered to be one of the greatest uh, New Testament textual scholars in the world. And he, went, he came from a fundamentalist church. He went to Moody Bible Institute, then he went to Wheaton College, then he went to Princeton. And what he was taught was that God hasn't preserved His words. And in his book, Misquoting Jesus, he said this, If God can't preserve His words, why should I believe He inspired them in the first place? I think that's pretty good logic. I think he's absolutely right. The only problem is, he was given false information. God has preserved His words, and He also inspired them. We have, we can hold in our hands, the very inspired and preserved words of God. God has supernaturally preserved His words so that you may hold them in your hands. And when you read them, you can rest in them, trust them, and obey them. Amen. You don't have to have Jim Alter's words. You have the words of God that you hold in your hands. And you know the wonderful thing about that? The Bible says in Acts 17.11, speaking about the Bereans, it says, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word that was preached, the word with all readiness of mind. And I know that you have that readiness of mind when you're looking at me and you're doing things like this. With all readiness of mind. And then search the Scriptures to see whether those things were so. So look, you don't test your Bible by the preacher. You test your preacher by the Bible. But in order to do that, you have to have an authoritative Bible. You see how that works? We have to do it. How many of you believe that we ought that, that our Supreme Court justices ought to interpret the Constitution in the way it was written? How many of you believe that? Right. It's not a living and breathing thing that you can make that you can change to your whim. Well, we as Bible believers, we can't change the Bible to our whim. We have to receive it as it was given and as it has been preserved. And so that's a, it's a wonderful promise that we have. They're permanent words. The Bible says this, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Now, now how long is it settled? Forever. Forever. Do you know what? It's, in, it's interesting. Jesus said that I judge no man. The words that I speak unto you, they shall judge you in that last day. What are people going to be judged by at the last day? The Bible. The Bible. So... Could a just God judge us according to something, a standard, that He's not revealed to us? No. No, no, no. That's not the God that we serve. He gave us the Word. All right? Then, the Bible says in Psalm 119, Thy Word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. That's verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. You young people, I really want you to mark that Psalm 119, 160. It's really important that you get that. Because what you will run up against, maybe at the Christian school, maybe at your public school where you're dealing with friends who go to other churches who are Christians, when you go to a Christian college sometimes, they'll, you'll go to a college that does not believe the Genesis account of creation. Well, the Bible says it's true from the beginning, and Genesis says, in the beginning. Amen. Amen? And it is true from the beginning. You can believe it all. This is my favorite verse. Okay, There was a lady named Sue Gerard. Her husband, Al Gerard, used to come and preach uh, for my dad when uh, I, was just, I, was, I was very young. And um, she wrote a song about this verse. And honestly... I just thought she was really pretty. And I loved Sue Gerard. I was a little kid, and this became my favorite verse. I had no idea that a good portion of my ministry was going to be preaching this verse. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. 
I want you to think about something. This is one of the coolest things. You, I, how many of you want to hear something cool right now? Maybe wake you up a little bit. You want to hear something really interesting. So when the Bible was written, it was written on papyrus. And you know what papyrus was. You were taught that in school. There were these reeds that would grow along the river. They'd take those reeds and they'd flatten them out and mash them together. And that would turn into paper. And it was, it was papyrus. But it's not a very durable material because it's, it's grass. That's what it's made of. But the, God knew that. God knew that His words would last longer than the medium that they were written on. You, you know why? God can remember what He wrote. In the book of Jeremiah, you had Jehudi and the, the, the king, and the king took and cut up the Bible with his penknife and threw it in the fire. Do you know what the good news is? God remembered what he wrote. And he had Jeremiah write it again, and then he added some more to it. Then he had him write it again, and he added some more to it. Then they tied a rock around it and threw it in the river. But we still have it. Why? Because God remembered what he wrote. Do you know that no one ever saw the first copy of the law? Because God wrote it with his finger on a stone tablet, and Moses broke it. He got mad, and I would be Moses. I'd get mad and break something that God had done. You know, just crazy. But you know the good news is? You tell me. God remembered what He wrote. And so the Word of God lasts longer than what it is written on. Now here's what's so important. That's why God's people were constantly copying it and copying it and sending it out and copying it and copying it and copying it. And copying it. What a wonderful thing that is. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. This last verse demonstrates the brevity of everything around us, but God's word is going to stand. In the midst of all this decay, God's word remains. You can trust it with your life. There are also precious words. Is the Bible precious to you? Man, it's so good. Precious words. And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. Psalm 119, 47. When we spend time in God's Word, in God's words, they become ever more precious to us. I want to say one thing about that. Be careful with people that are constantly talking about God's Word who don't believe the words. See, it's amazing how many people believe God's Word, they just don't believe what it says. See, the words are vital. They're vital. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, John 6, 63. The flesh profiteth nothing, he said. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. How many of you see the flesh, the body of Jesus right now? None of you. But we have his words. They're spirit and their life, they're precious, but they're also preeminent. Look at what the Bible says in Psalm 138 too. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Does God care about his name? Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Does God care about his name? But the Bible says he's magnified his word above his name. So His Word is more important to us than His name. Why? Because His Word tells us what His name is. We can know who He is because of the Word, preeminent words. How could we ever overemphasize the importance of the Word of God? You know how important God's name is to Him. He wrote one of the Ten Commandments to make sure we understand, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. God, according to Psalm 138.2, has placed more importance on His Word than His name. That's why the Bible is our sole authority, folks. Do you remember what happened to Peter? Peter was on the Mount of Transfiguration with James and John, and Jesus spoke to Moses and Elijah about the death that he would accomplish. And Peter didn't know what to say, so he said it. Let's build three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you, Lord. And God overshadowed the, cloud, the, the mountain in a cloud and said, This is my son. Hear him. Hear him. And they came down off of the mountain Peter misunderstood the audible voice of God. Peter misunderstood what God said. He ended up denying Jesus Christ. And when you get to the books of First and Second Peter, you can see that the two great experiences that dominate his writing are the experience on the Mount of Transfiguration and the shame of denying the Lord Jesus Christ. And what did he say? Look with me at, I believe it's Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1, 
Look at verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with Him, in the holy mount. That's the Mount of Transfiguration. Now look at what he says. We have also... Uh, what are those next two words? More sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. What's he talking about? Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the what? Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So here's what Peter said. I heard the audible voice of God and I messed it up. Do you know that you and I could misinterpret the audible voice of God? But we have a more sure word of prophecy. We can judge every passage of Scripture in the light of every other passage of Scripture and we have a more sure word of prophecy that was given to us by the Holy Spirit. Holy men of God spake not their own. How, how does it say it? Uh, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's very important that we get this. The Bible is our sole authority. It is more sure than the very audible voice of God. All right. Now, what I want us to do right now and I'm sorry that some of these fonts are going to be a little small. You're going to want to look these verses up in your Bible. We're going to look at verses in the Bible and compare them on, that, that deal with the doctrine of salvation and compare them to modern translations. All right? So let's just do this. I'm going to try and do it as quickly as possible. The first is Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And we look at this passage when we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. The Bible says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old. Now look at what it says. From everlasting. We understand that Jesus Christ didn't begin at Bethlehem and he didn't end at Calvary. Amen? We believe in the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. He existed before His birth, and He existed before everything. He exists from everlasting. He exists in eternity. He is the eternal God. Here's what the NIV says. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, look at, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Jesus didn't have an origin. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. How many of you see that that is a serious doctrinal issue? Because it changes who God is. Jesus did not have a beginning. Now, there are reasons in different texts where this came from. There was a group called the Monophysites who didn't believe that Jesus Christ had... that he, he, They believed He had two natures, a physical nature and a spiritual nature, and the physical nature and the spiritual nature never met. So there's reasons these things entered into some manuscripts, but when it makes its way into a modern translation, this is a problem. Amen? It's a problem. Look at the next one. Look at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. In verse 55, Luke 9 and verse 55. Now remember, every word of God is pure. Do you all believe that? His words are preserved. All of that is factual. All right, so Luke 9, 55. But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. Remember what they wanted to do. They, there were guys prophesying and he wanted, they wanted to call down fire from heaven and kill these guys. <laughs> That's. I would like to do that. All right, but... <laughs> So Luke 9.55, But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what, what, spirit, what manner of spirit ye are of. Now look at what the Bible says. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Aren't you glad that's the truth? How many of you think that's an important truth? Seriously. Right? And they went to another village. They didn't kill them. They went on. 
NIV says this, But he turned and rebuked them, and they went to another village. Is there anything important that's missing there? For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. I've got a friend, Doug Stauffer, and he was preaching at a church that was in between pastors. And they were going to call a new pastor, and they were trying to decide whether they were going to call a pastor that would use the King James or modern translations of the Bible. So he heard about that, and he knew that people there had all different translations of the Bible with them in the service. And his sermon, it's in chapter 4 of his book, One uh, Book Stands Alone, and uh, some of these verses came from that. And he, he, only, he preached a salvation sermon using only the passages that have been removed from the, from the modern translations. And so he's preaching, and kids are looking at their Bible, they're looking at their dad, they're going like this. What? what, what it's not there. What, what's he preaching? This is, it's an interesting thing. How many of you think it's important for the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives but to save them? How many of you think that's important? Amen. Yeah, it's not there if you're using an NIV, an ESV. Oh, here, let me make sure that you can see the versions. ESV, RSV, and the New Living Testament. It's gone from all of those. And the NIV, of course. All right, so Matthew 18.11. Would you look at that? Matthew 18, 11, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. How many of you are glad Jesus came to save that which was lost? Is that, a, is that an important truth? I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever heard this statement? There are no important doctrines changed in the modern translations. Have you ever heard that statement? How many of you think this is an important doctrinal statement? Okay. This is the NIV. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety and nine on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? Is there anything missing there? Verse 11 is not in that Bible. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. It's not there. It's taken out. Salvation in the modern versions. Oh, wait a minute. ESV, RSV, New American Standard Bible Update. In the, in the New American Standard, it's bracketed and questioned. It's there, but there's a bracket on it that says this isn't found in the best manuscripts or whatever. John 6, 47. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Right? John 6, 47. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. NASB update and the ESV. Now, how many of you think that there needs to be an object of your belief? And that object must be Jesus Christ. Amen. This is a big problem. Salvation. Doctrine of salvation. Look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 24. This one is, this one's tough. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? You know, people are trusting in their money. It's hard for them to believe in Jesus Christ. People are trusting in themselves. They don't trust in Jesus. How many of you have ever seen that happen before? Yeah. Here's the NIV, Mark 10, 24. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. Did that change the message? To change it, look at what other translations. ESV, the NASB. Now, let me just make a statement here that's really important. Most, and I'm going to say 98%, that's, that's my estimation of it, of the preachers that use modern translations, they've never seen this information. They're not familiar with it. It's not taught in the Bible colleges. Now, it's taught in a Bible college we would support. But in, in, in most of the seminaries and colleges, they are not given this information. They're said, watch out for crazy people that like the King James. That's about the way the discussion will go. Okay? Now, this is really... And so I, I just want you to know, I'm not casting aspersions on preachers that use other translations of the Bible. Most of them have never heard it. Here's how I know. I don't know that I've ever had a conversation with a preacher that uses a modern translation that knew any of this. It's com it, it completely floors them. All right? 
Um, 2 Corinthians 11.3, But I fear, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And let me tell you why this verse is so important. Within the first hundred years of the ascension of Jesus Christ to the right hand of the Father, people had added works and baptism to salvation. They had been corrupted from the simplicity that we have in Christ Jesus. Vital message, a vital passage of Scripture for us. Here's what the NIV says. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. That's not the same message. How many of you see that that's not the same message? Your pure and sincere devotion to Christ? No, the simplicity that is in Christ. Different message. All right, Ephesians 1.12, the Bible says that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Do you know what we do? You hear the Word of God, and look at the next verse, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the Word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So what happens is you trust Christ, you hear His Word, you believe in Him, and you're sealed. All right, here's what the modern translations do this. The NIV. In order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. Okay? Look at Mark chapter 4. I want you to see something. Parable of the sower. Mark 4. Look at verse 14. The sower soweth what? The word. Does that have anything to do with our context? Okay, look at what it says. The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown, but when they have... What does it say? Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. You're not included in Christ when you hear the word of God. It's a real doctrinal issue. Now, remember, this only matters if the words matter. Does that make sense? It only matters if the words matter. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible, look at, go here, I can go back, I got it right here. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. We're not marked with a seal, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit. The teaching is just different. It's different. So, let's go on. I wonder if those people that get a mark in the tribulation period might think that's interesting. Now, now let me tell you. I don't believe that the translators of the NIV were trying to change doctrine. They're just not as concerned about His words as we are. That's what it comes down to. Um, 1 Corinthians 15.3 For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now look at how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. How did He die? He died on the cross. It's vital. NIV for what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. It's just different. Colossians 1.14, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that a good verse? Here's the NIV. In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Do you think the blood of Jesus is important? It's interesting, isn't it? Jesus had to die on the cross. 1 John 1, 7, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Here they take away Christ. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Now remember that blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the Messiah who came and fulfilled the law, died on the cross for us. It's important truth in the Gospel. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world... Now, of all the verses in the world to change, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son 
that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, His one and only Son, the Bible says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not, but as many as received Him, to them gave you power to be called the sons of God. Only begotten is vital. Jesus Christ is the only one that emanates from the Father. He's the, Jesus Christ is the only one who the Father overshadowed the Virgin Mary and she was with child. He's the only one. Amen? How many of you think that's a vital part of doctrine? It's just removed. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which, look at, are saved, it is the power of God. How many of you are saved? And were saved by the preaching of the cross. What is preaching? It's boldly declaring the Word of God. Look, you're lost. Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. You need to get saved. That's preaching. All right? <coughs> Here's the NIV. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to, the, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. How many of you are glad you're not being saved? I'm glad I'm saved. It's happened. 2 Corinthians 5.21. We put, quote this passage constantly. For He hath made Him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. I cannot change myself. The Bible says earlier in this chapter, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. Okay, now look at what it says. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's that process, just like being saved. It's that process. Now, understand how this is much more palatable to a broader range of Christianity. When you have an exclusive gospel where salvation takes place at a point in time where it's by uh, grace, through faith, alone, apart from works, this doesn't, this doesn't fly with us, does it? It doesn't fly. It doesn't fit the doctrine of the Scriptures. But it's more palatable to a broader audience. Acts 15, 19, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Here, are turning to God. Are turning. No, it's, it's not a process. It happens at a point in time. 2 Corinthians 2, 15, uh, For are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. Look it. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. That perish and are perishing. Are saved, are being saved. How many of you can see that there, that, that there is a, an intentional change in the language? Now look, I could, we could go on and on and on. This is a serious issue. Let me just be, let me real plainly ask you this question. Are there any changes in the doctrine of salvation as presented in the modern versions we looked at? Are there any changes? Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. You can't change this stuff. Now look, you might be here and you might say, well, you understand that there are variant readings in the manuscripts. Not really. Not really. There is a, there's a family of manuscripts, which are the majority of them, and there are like five that are different. But these people want to change it by the five. And, and we could get technical with it. I'm not going to do that this morning. But there's a, there's a philosophical difference. And here's the philosophical difference. We believe in preservation. Those who hold to those other manuscripts, they don't believe in preservation. So these are people that want to hold to biblical principles, but not biblical words. What does the Bible tell us to hold to? The words of God. Look at John chapter 8. Verse 28. Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And He that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please Him. As He spake these, what's it say? Words, many believed on Him. 
Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on Him, If ye continue in My word, look it, then are ye My disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You can't continue in His Word if you don't have His Word. Is that fair? And that means you can't be free. It's wonderful. Look at John chapter 17. Christianity 101, salvation. Verse 14. John 17, verse 14. This, is, this verse describes the Bible-believing Baptist in history. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should, shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them, that is to set them apart. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Look, folks, we can't be saved and we can't grow in the Lord without the Bible. Amen? amen? Hey, guys, that's a good place to say amen. amen. We can't be saved and we can't be sanctified without the Bible. Amen. amen. Let me be very clear. I'm not saying we're the only ones who are saved and sanctified. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, let's not change the Bible. Let's not remove clear statements of truth from the Scriptures to make it more palatable or for whatever reason. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And that verse is removed from almost every translation, except for the King James Bible. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. There's so much that could be said.